Uh, you have the thickest portfolio here. I like I counted this. more than 50 pages which were submitted to the network and which were given to us. I think I have asked this also in my uh, post in the social media. And um, post-Ukraine, assuming that you have a peace agreement within the next two weeks, which is more likely, do you see a new political and economic order, but this time you have other political actors like Moscow, Beijing, and even Tehran? Yes. What's your take on that? Uh, so, yes, I believe there will be a new world order. Uh, and I think I am, I am certain that uh, Tehran and Beijing are watching very, very closely what will happen to Ukraine. There will be a geo geopolitical balance of power. It also depends on what the, re what the re reaction of the EU uh, and the United States will be. I think the United States we can predict fairly accurately. EU is in a more difficult spot simply because they are highly dependent for their energy to Russia and how they will balance that. I, I know that the Senator, uh, that the President Biden has just signed with the EU a, 50, uh, uh, um, a deal to supply from the United States and from other countries uh, 15 billion tons of uh, gas which will cover some of the needs of, of, of the EU. But again, uh, that's not something that can instantly be made, uh, to, 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 to instantly be applied. There will be a transition period uh, because it is a very large economic infrastructure that has been developed for Europe to take advantage of uh, the gas supplies out of Russia. Uh, these, yeah. are, these are all terribly large forces and inevitably will change things. Yeah, well it seems like you have a more entire scenario, uh, future scenario in mind. But um, what I have used really is the, from a content analytical perspective, using events data analysis, meaning I'm paying attention to the verbs being used by the negotiators. And, that's the, and this is not Polyanish, by the way, Mr. Marcos, mm. it's just that I feel that uh, Putin will not allow the conflict to spill over. It will encapsulate within the Ukraine, a conflict area, yeah. and but that yes, I still believe that uh, within the next two weeks you have a peace agreement. I sincerely hope so, uh, because we, the, you know, misunderstandings, mistakes can occur, um, with Poland being right there uh, on the border of Ukraine. We already have had reports of uh, missiles that mistakenly flew into Poland. And these are the kind of things that we, we have to be very careful about. I think uh, maybe uh, that is one thing that they can agree upon, Russia and the West, as we have referred to it often. Mr. Um, Marcus, I, um, earlier, I don't know if you were around already when I asked questions about the projected visit of state visit of Vladimir Putin here in the Philippines. Uh, because the Duterte administration has only so many more breaths to, to take before the end uh, of their regime, of their tenure. When you become president, uh, will he honor that invitation that uh, Duterte had given to him? To certainly. do a state visit? Oh, not well, just a visit, a must, state visit. Uh, well, certainly. Uh, why not? We, we have diplomatic relations with Moscow. Uh, we should uh, continue to, to honor, that, uh, honor that agreement that we have with uh, Russia and we must continue to again cultivate the relationships that are beneficial to the country. Uh, and it's not, you know, we, as long as we make our position very clear that self-determination is an important principle as far as the Philippines is concerned and uh, in that context then we can still speak on many other subjects with, with, with Russia. Yeah, so that means you are not telegraphing something to the United States of America by uh, welcoming uh, Vladimir Putin in a state visit. It, it, it need not be Russia or Vladimir Putin, any country, uh, I think, that uh, would like to come. Uh, and visit uh, and would feel that there is something beneficial to be gained by furthering, strengthening relationships between our two countries is something that we should always be open to. Thank you. Thank you. So my question is, when this new world order that you think could happen, 
after um, a peace treaty gets concluded between Ukraine and Russia, how will you position our country in this new geopolitical order? It very, it very clearly will de depend on what the exit strategy will be for the West, for EU, and for Putin. Uh, in the in the uh, in the in the peace agreement that they, that we hope uh, they will sign, uh, what the nature of that agreement will be? Uh, will it be status quo? Uh, the forces that are in the United that are in Ukraine, the Russian forces that are and Belarusian forces in, that are already in Ukraine, will they just stay where they are, status quo? Will they be told to to withdraw? Um, I, I only say that because it is very important to Putin's position domestically. Um, it is, he, he is in a very precarious place be, be, because it has not gone according to plan. I, I suspect that he was hoping that it would be a similar situation as it was in Crimea, where they pretty much just walked in. Uh, very, with very little resistance. But then they prepared, the, they prepared Crimea for a long time. They were helping the rebel groups, the Russian-speaking groups, and they were developing them. And they built, a, they built a corridor on the east side of Crimea, within which uh, the Russians could cross the border very easily. That hasn't been the case in Ukraine. And so, depending on how it is viewed, the peace treaty, that we hope will come, uh, it depends on how it is viewed by the local uh, domestic political uh, uh, scenarios in, in Russia itself. That, whatever the, the, whatever the reaction will be to Putin, will give us, one, will fix one of the variables in the geopolitical new world order. So we still have to wait to see what happens. Um, I'm sure China, is waiting uh, with bated breath to see what's going to what's going to happen here. Tehran, I'm sure, as, you, as uh, the professor mentioned, is clearly uh, a player in this regard. And uh, in the Middle East, now so far it has not affected the Middle East uh, in any way. So far, but maybe if it works out for Russia, if it works out for Vladimir Putin. China might be emboldened to make their own moves. Uh, Tehran might be emboldened to make their own moves. On the other hand, if it is very much a, uh, uh, a, a rejection of the idea uh, of Putin of taking over a, a country, uh, then perhaps that will also influence their thinking as to what can and cannot be done for their own interests. So yes, I, I, I don't think we can predict very closely, because we cannot. I, 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 ho I hope to be as optimistic as the professor, but I don't see it happening in two weeks. To be perfectly honest, I hope it is. I hope it does, because the, the economic effects on every single person in the world has been enormous, and it is going to be enormous for a good long while. It's not going to go away anytime soon. Sir, since we have a mutual defense treaty with the United States. Um, that would affect, I'm, I'm sure that, that would play a role That's in how, you know, our country would position ourselves in this new geopolitical uh, world order. So my question is, to what extent will you allow the United States uh, influence your actual decision making in how you're going to craft the future foreign policy of the Philippines when that new world order has already taken shape? Well, we, we, we have a very special relationship with the United States and it's uh, something that we, have, uh, that we have had and developed over a over hundred years, starting from being essentially a colony uh, to a very strong partner here, in this, especially in this part of the world, in the region. And that, I think, uh, has, uh, has been a good thing for both, both countries, both for the United States and for the Philippines. And that we, we, I think we can still depend on that. But the, uh, the scenario that you spoke about, where we historically have always been with the United States, is still, I think, a carryover, a hangover of the, of the uh, uh, Cold War. And we discussed it a little bit the last time. And I don't think those, uh, those, uh, uh, the, the geopolitics of today, up 
uh, are the same. And we now have to uh, tread uh, that very fine line to make sure that it's the, America, it's the Philippines, <laughs> it's the Philippine interests that are, that are, prom that are prim uh, the, the primacy of Philippine interests in anything. Now, that's a, the, in geopolitics especially, we have uh, another uh, superpower 600 kilometers from our coastline, uh, China. Uh, that, that puts, again, uh, the Philippines in quite a precarious position. We're lucky because we're important geopolitically, uh, even just ge we're strategically. Uh, we are unlucky because we are important geopolitically, <laughs> and we've become a bit of a, uh, a, uh, a hot potato when it comes to that. So we definitely have to consider what is best always for the Philippines. And how do we achieve that? With our existing uh, partnerships, uh, partnerships, alliances, uh, as they stand now, with what will be a new world order. Will it, be a very, will it be a very big change? Will it be a small, slight change? Will it be a big change for Russia and a small change for everybody else? It's, there are many moving parts to this thing, and it's not something that is easily uh, definable. Uh, but I think, once the, the peace agreement is made, we will study it very, very closely and we will ask our best experts to determine what is the effect in these other countries. What is the effect to Tehran, to Iran? What's the, what's the effect? How, did they, how does it change their thinking in Beijing? How does it change the thinking in Washington, D.C.? Uh, these are the big players. These are the people we have to deal with. Uh, so, yes, it's not... Uh, I wish I could give you a categorical answer, but until we know exactly what that peace treaty will contain, it's very difficult and to know what will happen after that in Russia. How will the power structure change? Will, 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 there be, will, will, will Putin be removed? Will he still maintain his position? All of these things are, 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 going, to, are, are going to play a part in what it will look like after that, uh, after that peace agreement. Uh, with this as a backdrop, the discussion with Russia, Ukraine, I was wondering if you can pivot to domestic concerns, particularly your energy policy. Yeah. Because as you said, you know, the conflict is being felt worldwide and among the things that we are seeing are sky-high fuel prices. But how would you address this? What would, you, what would be your policies, particularly with energy security, you know, going beyond this issue? In the past week or so, uh, since since the, the war in Ukraine began, I have been espousing a policy of subsidizing all oil imports. Because I, uh, the, the idea is that, yes, transport is the first sector that's going to be affected, but everyone will be affected. And therefore, if we are to support everyone, we have to subsidize all oil imports, in my view. However, I have been crunching the numbers. We can't do it. We cannot afford it. It's that simple. So we have to focus now. Now, maliwanag, yung mga transport group talagang naghihing ano, dahil dito sa pagtas ng presyo ng, ng langis. Eh, pero alam naman natin, pag tumas ang presyo ng langis, sabay-sabay susunod na yung mga iba. So we have to focus in, uh, we have to focus in the, in the, the sectors that uh, will actually, that will, that will mitigate the effects. Of, uh, of the oil price rise. Um, perhaps, well, the, there still exists the option of uh, perhaps giving a tax holiday on the excise tax, on the excise taxes to, uh, to the oil, uh, for the oil imports. However, the pandemic is not over. Uh, we do not know what is going to happen next. When each time we thought tapos na, it came back. And I, we, I'm sure all of us after Christmas, after the Omicron hit at the end of January, sabi natin siguro, baka tapos na ito. Baka wala na. But then we hear news now about Korea, about China, about Hong Kong, that they're locking down again. So we have to, we need the, those funds. Well, we don't, the government doesn't need the funds, people need the funds. And so we will still have to, we will still have to continue to collect as much as we can in uh, preparation for any possible, uh, any possible occurrence in terms of the pandemic. 
Baka may bagong strain, baka may babalik. But I don't think we will ever return to a time of lockdown anymore. Senator, just before we go on the break, uh, I was wondering if you can clarify your position on the oil price stabilization fund because I, there's been some talk in social media to report, but I don't know if you, you are. Of course, the appeal um, is that there will be subsidy when prices are high. Yes. But the downside is that prices will remain high because uh, when, when, when global prices dip. Yeah. And there's the argument, of course, that the market is always more efficient uh, in determining prices. Well, could you clarify your position? No, I think it, was, it, it, it is not to change the price of the oil. It's to change the rate of change. It is to, to try and mitigate the rate of change. So that, let's say, if uh, the price increase is from Sunday to Monday, instead of increasing the full, let's say we're going to increase by, I don't know, five pesos, let's say. Instead of doing it all in one shot, we do it slowly because we have a stabilization fund. There is no way to bring the price of oil down from the Philippines. Uh, we, we, we are at the, at the mercy of, uh, uh, of the oil producers. We in the Philippines, if I'm not mistaken, are 0.07% of the fossil fuel market, uh, and therefore have very little influence on pricing. And we, do not, we produce very little in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, uh, oil, oil production. Malampaya is about, uh, they, they say, will dry up in the next two or three years. Uh, so yes, it is, it is a very, very big problem. But the OPSF that I proposed and, uh, is really to lessen the impact. And um, instead of making the impact instantaneous, uh, we will try to make it happen over a longer time to give businessmen, consumers more time to adjust and to plan. Uh, for the new regime of, uh, uh, of oil prices and oil products uh, that would come to the Philippines.